website, everyone. I'm Liv from one of our ICU physios. Um, I've probably worked here since about July now. Um, before that, I was a year at Glenfield, and then the year before that, for Rico and everything else at the general. So I've been across all three sites now. Um, so I've done a bit on like press clearance and um, I think it's more the clear way that you guys aren't too familiar with. Um, so I thought I'd focus a bit more around that today. So understand what like the chest physio part is, what we're trying to achieve and the different techniques that we use to clear chests. Um, so I thought, what well, what a rest physio is good at. So to simplify things, there's only ever like four problems that uh, we look at or treat. So dispute and retention being one of them, reduced lung volumes, increased work of breathing, and then reduced exercise tolerance. These are the, some of the things that we don't have an awful lot of stuff that we can help with. So things like pneumothoraces, um, pleural effusions, any edema, uh, diaphragm splinting, so like big swollen abdomens and their work of breathing has gone up because of that. Not a lot we can help with there. And then Although we, I do consider myself a bit of an all round physio working on ICU, um, your dodgy ankle or shoulder, if you please go to uh, the physiotherapy department or use that email to uh, refer yourself there, I will not give you very good advice. So different things we might do for each of those problems. So things like sputum retention, optimising that patient, so humidification and nebulizers. Movement and exercise would definitely be the first port of call. We want these people and everyone on ICU to be up and out of bed as soon as possible. Um, so you might see us shake people's chests and things. So we call those vibs. Um, something called bubble pep. So pep is positive expiratory pressure. And essentially all we do is get them to blow through a straw into some water. And that creates like an oscillatory effect to try and help shear secretions from uh, the airway wall and also provide a bit of peak as they do it. And then we've got lots of positive pressure techniques as well. So we can use manual hyperinflation, so bagging, um, ventilator hyperinflation, so using the ventilator itself and increasing the pressures on that. Intermittent positive pressure be breathing. Um, you might hear us talk about it as the bird that's just because it was like the old brand name essentially so if we're birding someone it's intermittent positive pressure breathing um, and then the cough assist which is the clear way so reduce lung volume to, again push movement and exercise and then we've also got those positive pressure techniques again that we can definitely use for that and then your increased work of breathing combination of like the above, if that's going to be the cause of their increased work of breathing, medical management, and then more um, like the anxiety related things, using lots of breathing control techniques to try and slow the work of breathing down. Um, but every, all, all of those problems are going to be solved by that patient being as normal as possible, really pushing for early mobility and out of bed as soon as possible. So we've got Rehab November coming up week after next. And we're going to go for a big push of like rise before nine. Um, I think Glenfield are quite good at it. All their cardiac surgery patients are out of bed by the time we got onto the unit at half eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and we'd quite like that to happen with a lot of our surgical patients since the general have moved over there and the HBB lot. They're all quite good at getting out of bed now as well, first thing before nine. So we're going to try and put that into the culture here as well as much as possible. So what limits chest clearance in intensive care? Obviously these patients aren't moving. Flat on their back all day, not exercising, not even doing simple things like getting themselves a cup of tea and stuff like that. So normal general exercise. Inadequate humidification or dehydration. Um, these patients might not be able to, they might be for free fluids and things like that, but they simply can't reach their water. So they end up getting really dehydrated. 
little simple things like that can cause them to get um, problems with their chest. Weak cough, obviously everyone who's intubated is going to have like no glottis closure whatsoever and that's one of the main stipulations of having a good cough. Um, but then they've been on ICU for long enough, they're going to have poor inspiratory effort as well, poor expiratory effort, so all of that's going to have an impact on their cough. Um, and yeah, the whole ICU acquired weakness and any underlying pathology. So they might not come in with a chest problem, but they've developed a VAP or a hospital acquired pneumonia. So onto the chest clearance side, we want to try and optimize those patients as much as possible. So we've got the big argument of HMEs versus heated humidified ventilation. I'm a big believer that we need to heat and humidify all of our patients pretty much. Um, we did at the general, we do at the Glenfield. It's probably only here that there's a little bit more resistance to changing from uh, that HME to that heated humidified circuit. I think that both the other sites, if they've been ventilated more than 24, 48 hours, they go back on, they go onto heated circuits. Um, your HMEs obviously work by the patient humidifying themselves essentially. So it catches the heat and moisture and then with that breath back in, it's meant to exchange it. But they're only about 50 to 75 efficient and your normal nasal pharynx passageway is more like 80 to 85 percent. Um, and if they get saturated with water, cause a lot of airway resistance, <coughs> their extra dead space within your circuit as well. Um, and whereas your external heater, um, you don't have that extra dead space, there's a bit better CO2 blow off, there's evidence that you're less likely to get VAP. Um, so does they still have a HME on it? No, they don't. You shouldn't have a HME with a... They have a different version of the filter. You just have the bacterial filter at the ventilator end. You don't have one before. So that still gets wet when it's changing. Yeah, it only should need changing every 24 hours. If the patient's respiratory rate's higher, it will get wetter quicker. Um, but, you, yeah, they don't have a, tend to have a problem changing it like every 24 hours or so. No, everything's exactly the same. Um, there was talk that you get bigger filters, essentially, um, and we did have them for a short period. I think we got one box and then they've disappeared again. Um, so we could, yeah, if we get a more permanent order of having those like bigger filters, maybe that might be one of the best things. But yeah, even with those skinny ones, they definitely had them when I was at Glenfield as well last year. And yeah, it's just, I think having new nurses in, there's been a lot of support from intersurgical come in and do a lot of training. Uh, as long as people just recognise to empty that water trap and to change that bacterial filter at the end, should be okay. You shouldn't really get a lot of problems with them. Um, and I've got a little video. Recordings. The air was supplied in so the ignore your American guy. But this is essentially an airway under an electric, a, electron microscope. Directional airflow has been used in all demonstrations. As we mentioned earlier, heat and water vapor are normally partially recovered during expiration. As the clip starts, the right trachea has been exposed to a constant airflow. So yeah, the 100% humidity, which is ideally what the Fisher Paykel provide. Although you can see tiny pieces, you get like this movement. You can see that's like the beating of the cilia across the membrane, whereas here you can see areas where that is not working as well. The dark spots so quickly across yeah, the important for the to have good humidification, essentially, just for mucociliary escalator after only an hour at the lower humidity mucus layer and then, yeah, right gets very quickly dry. dry um so here's a bit of evidence as well about the um about humidification so it, it's an old study but it's not going to have changed essentially so 100 percent humidity is better for um, mucosal function in the airway 
and then again this again fairly old study but from 2003 um, in difficult to wean patients HME actually led to an increased respiratory workload um, and impaired gas exchange um, and then this one was a bit newer from this year looking retrospectively at COVID-19 patients and I think it found like of all the patients essentially that were plugging off or um, had poor CO2 removal um, it was CO2 removal was better in patients that use the heat humidification rather than HMEs and then this was another one about endotracheal tube occlusion um, again from 2022 saying that occlusion was a lot less in those that had heated humidificated humidified circuits I think it was quite astonishing as well I think after 11 days of being of these patients being intubated about 80 percent of those with HMEs had had plugging off and it was less than 20% of those with heated humidified circuits. So we've also got nebulizers to help us optimize these patients. Uh, so we've got normal saline um, and <coughs> hypotonic saline. So saline nebs work through osmosis essentially. Um, you meant to increase the amount of sodium in your airway <coughs> to attract more water into your airway to try and get rid of those secretions and make it easier to cough out. So obviously with those hypertonic salines, you get a greater osmosis gradient, so more water. So you should in theory get more clearance. Um, bronchodilators, so things like ifotropium and salbutamol. Um, DNAs, which you probably we won't use at all really on adult intensive care unless we get a CF patient. It's only licensed in CF patients and just because if you gave it to a normal patient it would just send your secretions to water essentially and because they've got such thick salty secretions essentially that it works in those patients and then things like acetylcysteine and carbocysteine the mucolytics but obviously carbocysteine doesn't really have any real-time changes for our intensive care patients unless we're expecting them to stay for a month so prescribing them for a short term isn't going to have a massive benefit to them. Um, uh, it's, I think it's, it's more fast acting than the carbocysteine, but again, it just like, it's like a protein essentially that snips up your the bonds within your uh, like sputum to try and just break it down. But there's, um, was it this one? Yeah, it said that actually within ventilated patients, there wasn't a lot of um, difference between NAC versus normal saline. So actually, it's better off using hypertonics with those patients. Um, but I think in the new uh, guidelines for spinal cord injury patients, they just say to start throwing everything at all those patients. So give them NAC, give them all the saline nebulizers, give them all the bronchodilators as well. I think that guideline's going to come out in the next few weeks. And they're just going to advise throw everything at all at least spinal cord injury patients, especially the high level ones, just to prevent chest infections and things like that, to try and promote their secretion removal as best as possible. There's not a lot of good evidence for hypertonic saline either um, as a physiotherapy adjunct. Um, I think they're running a trial at the moment in like our ICU setting. Um, it's more done again in like those um, bronchiectasis patients or CF patients where all the evidence is. But anecdotally, we know that actually it does really help our treatment a lot of the time. So once we've um, optimized our patients as best as possible our chest currents essentially works by enhancing your respiratory flow to try and shear those secretions and move them up to somewhere where they can cough them out so we can increase our lung volumes to help respiratory flow we've got things like vibs 
So obviously work a lot better on someone who's got a much more compliant chest wall to try and increase that expiratory flow. And then we've got our assist. So these are the two that you might see on intensive care. So the one on the left is the old one. And then this is the more updated one with the touch screen on the right hand side. <clears throat> so it's manual insufflation to exufflation, which is just positive pressure, negative pressure. Um, evidence shows that like 40 to minus 40 has the greatest effect on clearance, but we often use like this minus five to 10 centimeter of difference to try and create that shearing effect and make that expiratory flow better, try and move the secretions up the airway. And if we're using it with tube patients, we often need higher pressures to overcome the tube resistance. And if you're going to like work in PEs where you have tiny, tiny, tiny tubes, a lot more airway resistance, they can go up to pressures of 60, so quite high. Um, so I've got another video. So this, um, I did this with Simon. We did a bronc and a clearway at the same time. So this is, so there's like three positive pressure breaths in, and then you'll see the act of the negative pressure. Yeah. So breath in, and then I'll be breath out in a second. So yeah, you can see it just like the action of a cough, it kind of collapses that airway down. It's not again the, like the best angle, but you can see the walls of the airway. collapse and obviously yield a fair bit of phlegm. So, um, I think we're fairly progressive in how much we use the clearway on our ICU. I went to a course a few weeks ago and they were talking about actually a, units have access to them but don't use them on ventilated patients as much as we do. Um, so I think we're fairly good at recognising what patients need, need it or would benefit from it. Um, And yeah, this is just, again, uh, another study that suggests that we just need to use those slightly higher pressures for patients who are, again, intubated or trachydented just to overcome that tube resistance. Um, because, yeah, if we use that same plus 40, minus 40, as we would with someone with a face mask, um, it just doesn't yield like the same expiratory force as um, if you did. And then evidence that it reduces incidence of VAP as well. So if we use it as a more prophylactic technique as well, we could help reduce incidence of VAP in intensive care. Um, so obviously there's some contraindications of when we don't <coughs> to use it, under pneumothoraces, pneumomediastinums, acute bronchospasms, cardiovascular instability, hemoptysis, high intracranial pressure, any surgical restrictions. Um, I wouldn't say there are many. We've used, I use a cough assist on thoracic patients before who still have pneumothoraces, pneumothoraces and things like that because they've got that drain in, it's bubbling and we can still use it. Um, I'm normally quite happy. Use them on our esophagectomy. We could do, but I suppose it's, it's up to the surgeon. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, we could, but they just it, don't. Sometimes people start. Yeah, I think they tend to use more like the positive pressure stuff in a lot of other trusts. So Claire, who's come over from Nottingham, they she tends to like use intermediate positive pressure breathing with an awful lot of their Ivor Lewis's. Um, we don't obviously we try and exercise them as much as possible here, but we could be burdening them as well. But it's up to the surgeons, I suppose. Um, the only the only main one is if you've had lung transplant and things because they're at risk of um, like the anastomosis of the lung. Yeah, and um, 
when we've had pneumonectomies at Glenfield as well, that just that stuff from the end of the bronchus that they've not wanted us to obviously disrupt with using a lot of positive pressure. Um, capitating lesions and then obviously like big bullet eye that we don't want to use it for. So any questions, you can turn the machine on and have a little look at what it does and things. What in just normal vented circuits? I think the nurses just do them whenever they get start to look wet. I don't know if they're doing that every 24 hours. Yeah, every 24 hours. Using the wet circuits, there's an ongoing debate about it. Yeah, uh, more often than probably about four hours. So what we're doing is every four hours. Yeah, well, that was changing every two hours. Well, two to four hours. Yeah. Again, I mean, yeah, there shouldn't be a HME anyway in the wet circuits, but yeah, the bacterial filters. Well, yeah. yeah. And we don't put people thinking in a wet circuit and call it a normal circuit. So, so there's different things on there. So. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> the, the post ops at Glenfield go on a dry circuit because they're only expected to be ventilated for a short period because it's cheap. If they're expected to be ventilated any more than 24, 48 hours, they go on a wet circuit. Have you noticed that the patient log? Yeah, I was there a whole year and I didn't see a patient log off. So the, the, you guys, the physios here are very pro wet circuits because they, they think that they're easy to clear. Uh, I, I, I'm in the concern group that doesn't have a strong opinion. So <laughs> very strong opinion. Yeah, they, yeah, they only use wet They only use wet Do they use the expensive one that they keep in? Exterotry and no. So they don't? They have the water trap they and the normal filter. Setup. Exactly the same setup. What are they doing? They don't. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I don't know why, but like the filter thing is an issue here compared to Glenfield. Must be something really different. Mm. I can't remember what it is. It gives a hello round of the when I change for filters because they were so heavy you could actually see a water level. Yeah, the water they water the water, yeah. It shouldn't yeah. happen though because that causes patient distress. Well, and the, fil the filters has been changed uh, during the day or so, so I'm not sure what's the issue. Mm. But well, I'm hoping that one of the little QI projects that may happen in the near future will look at the wet circuits and what we're doing with them compared to other people and see if we can work out yeah. a protocol for using them safely, which will hopefully calm sort of like some colleagues then. But yeah, and, and, and like, like I said, we did, no, <laughs> we, we we did have a, matters, matters, a, a box of like thicker filters, mm -hmm. which might be the one that solved the problem, but yeah. I think we got through that box and then never reordered that box. Yeah. And figure out what the difference is. It didn't seem to be any different. Mm. Mm. Well, I, wonder if, I wonder if it is, maybe it is a different viral filter on the machine. And, uh, maybe, maybe it would be good to go to that and just have a look. Well, I mean, it's, it's, well, well see, this project, <laughs> see this project gets off the ground. It's probably in the way already. But. Yeah, well, I guess this is yeah. I mean, yeah, there's. They sometimes often have like a thicker filters. The square one, rather than which, a round one. I mean, we've, we've got, got we've one. got the square one, but yeah, you yeah. can get ones that like double the size. So we've got you talking about the, uh, the yellow one. The yellow one. Mm. Yeah, we've got the square ones. I mean, they're not square. The red, thank you. But yeah, those ones. Yeah, but they're they're still smaller than the Glenfield ones. Right. So are, they, are they really chunkier or wider or? Well, yeah. Well, there you go. We've already found a difference. Anyway, we're probably yeah. off. Yeah, exactly. We're talking about something else, but nobody else is on. Well, if there's anybody else there, they're not interested. No, they're not smart <laughs> enough, have they? <laughs> no, I do not want to put wet circuits or um, no. So I'd say anyone who's productive should go on a wet circuit because as soon as like that starts drying out, it's going to be more of a problem to clear. Um, so ideally, yeah, as soon as someone is productive, they should be on a wet circuit. Not necessarily, because they might not then need NEBS. So yeah. I, think, I, mean, I don't think it's entirely surprised. I think that, that when I say this, so, the, so the green HME is the humidification device. So that, that is supposed to be doing a similar job. And I think there was a period earlier in one of the ways of COVID, but there were no HME filters. So I think people were using the wrong kind of filter. 
And it was interesting because as soon as you stop humidifying the ventilated patient, they, the tubes and the ventilators immediately entirely filled up with totally solid black gums. Yeah, and they needed their tube changing. The tubes were changing all the time, and you could go with loads of full rubbish, and it makes a huge difference. But I know you, it, if you, an HME will do the job for a bit, like for an anaesthetic for a day, an HME is really fine. But I think it would be on for more than a day. I would argue you probably should be on a wet circuit at some time. Because mm. would you want to breathe in and out totally unhumidified air? Because you can't humidify it through your nose anymore. Mm. It's like it's just drying you out. Yeah. And if you've got a tracheostomy patient, you yeah. should never be on a HME, in theory, because you're completely bypassing that upper airway. Yeah. So humidification from the URI completely ends, like, in your upper airway. And if we're bypassing it with a tracheostomy, they're not getting any internal um, humidification. Is that 21? Do you have a seat at night? I'm going to look at him at night. What's the... 21? 21 is... Yes, he's on the circuit. Is that tubing a little different? Is it just a white tube? Yeah, so it's it's green and white. So your inspiratory yeah. limb's yeah. green and your expiratory limb's white. That's what I said. That's what I said. You can tell there's many compensators. There's a cup. There's a little hot plate. There's blocks. And there's an air, there's a water trap. So half the other one is just a little bit. Yeah, it's not a little bit. How would you describe it? Like a little bucket. Yeah, it's not a little bit. So you'll have one of those things on the right. And then underneath, there's like a little. It's like a jam jar halfway on the circuit. And the water's going to collect in the jam jar. Yeah, it's like a little bit. Can I ask a question? Sometimes it doesn't. In terms of like the how often do you empty the cup? Whenever it gets whenever it's good. Yeah, whenever it gets full. Well if it's full with the gut might be a part of the problem. It can be. Yeah. It's yeah, in then, then totally fill up and, and you get Yeah, this is going to be totally idiotic question now. So you have to have both. You have to have the humidifier and you have to have the cup. Both working at the same time. Yeah. 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 So the 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 hotter the air is, the more water it can hold. So that green tubing is hot. So if you hold it, it's got a coiled wire through it yeah. that heats it. But the white wire is cold. Yeah. So as soon as that humidified air comes out, it condens condenses. Yeah. Which is why you get that rain out. So that's why you have those white parts sure. at the bottom. But you have to have the machine on at the same time. Okay. Yeah, you shouldn't. You, in theory, you shouldn't really get any rain out yeah, yeah, if that's absolutely. off because it'll be cold. But as soon as that's on, you sh will probably get some rain out. We get a little bit of just moisture. Mm. 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 I think I think it's a combination. Then not empty the cup and you know. Yeah. Well, because, it's, 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 I mean, it might be other things for their breathing resistance. It might be secretions. It might be an internal problem that's causing their airway resistance rather than the external problem. And sometimes you just change the filter and, the and then, yeah, the and it becomes like... fine again. Yeah, no, that's that's the problem. That's the mm. problem about having circuits is distinguishing between whether there's a problem with the equipment mm. and it is there is some problem which is normally the yellow filter gets full of water. Yeah. Or the yellow trap is full of water, which doesn't normally happen. Or is there actually a simply a problem with the patient, isn't it? Yeah. So are we, you know, do we have a lot of gunge yeah. inside that yeah. sure. medium bore airways? Can I ask, is there any, do, is, do you prefer a particular say line? No, I'm because that <laughs> <laughs> my favourite percent. Um, I put I put three percent on there, but they're only ever used in peds, yeah, so we only ever see 0 0.9 or, or seven. Um, yeah. Um, if I'm if I'm getting if I'm on call, everyone's getting seven percent. Um, well, you know, I think a lot of people on outside are having seven percent makes you cough, which is what it's for. Zero point nine percent makes you feel better. It doesn't make the patient feel better. It makes you feel better. It's just <laughs> and also, I'm doing something. <laughs> if they are on a wet circuit, they're really one hundred percent humidified, so there's no point in giving them more mm -hmm. yeah. But seven percent then is to make you cough. Okay. Like, it's an irritant. The point is something from other people. Mm. Cool. Does anybody at Blankford have any questions? <clears throat> Do you guys have any questions? No. 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 Cool. Thank you.
Не worries. Today's general club is about the cardiac arrest and mortality related to the intubation procedure in critically ill adult patients in the ICU. I'm Sean, one of the ICM trainees, ST4. So this is the journal that was published in Critical Care Medicine in 2018, April. Um, so ICU intubation related cardiac arrest occurs in one of 40 procedures with high immediate and 28 days mortality, but there is very less studies has been done about this. There are, there are some studies which are done about the intubation related mortality in the ICU and the ward and the a &E. But I think this is the only study that we have which was done solely on basis of the ICU. It's a French study. The objectives of the study was to determine the prevalence of and the risk factors for cardiac arrest during intubation in the ICU and the association of ICU intubation related cardiac arrest with 28 days mortality. It's a retrospective analysis of prospectively collected data and uh, it was done in France in 64 ICUs of France and the patients were all critically ill patients requiring intubation in the ICU. The inclusions and exclusions criteria. The inclusions are all the intubation procedure, patients with age more than 18 years and older and performed in the ICU only in the ICU were included in the study. An exclusion criteria where the patients who were admitted for cardiac arrest or the patients who were intubated for the cardiac arrest were excluded from the study. Uh, so basically the study was done, uh, the rest retrospectively analyzed the data from intubation procedures in randomized and observational studies with different databases in 64 ICUs. Similar data was collected before, during, and after the procedures in all the ICUs, in the 64 ICUs in the France. Uh, so the primary outcome of the study was cardiac arrest was defined as asystole, bradycardia, or ventricular dysrhythmia with non-measurable blood pressure during or within the five minutes after intubation requiring CPR. The secondary outcomes were cardiac arrest without return of spontaneous circulation, severe and moderate complications related to intubation and long term outcome, which are the mortality rate of patients suffering from cardiac arrest at day 28 and the length of the ITU stay. The severe complications were defined as a severe hypoxia, which was defined as saturation falling less than 80% or decrease in the saturation more than 10% in case of maximum saturation before the intubation was less than 90%. Other severe complications were severe cardiovascular collapse, which was defined as systolic blood pressure of less than 65 millimeter of mercury, recorded at least once or less than 90 millimeter mercury lasting for 30 minutes, despite giving 500 to 1 liter of crystalloid fluid bolus or decrease of systolic blood pressure of more than 20% if the blood pressure was less than 55, 65 millimeter of mercury before intubation or requiring reduction of increasing doses of 30% of vasoactive support. Cardiac arrest and death during the intubation. Moderate complications were considered in the study were difficult intubation, which was defined as more than two attempts severe ventricular or supraventricular arrhythmia requiring intervention, esophageal intubation, agitation post intubation, pulmonary aspiration and dental injuries. So this is the flow of the uh, study. So in the 64 ICUs of the France, the amount of patient that they initially studied was 19, 1918. Out of 1918, Around 71 patients were excluded because they met the exclusion criteria. Either the 71 patients were admitted for cardiac arrest or was intubated for cardiac arrest. So they were excluded from the study. Uh, included patients were around 1,847 for the analysis. And among this 1,847, around 2.7% patients, which is around 49 patients had cardiac arrest related to the intubation. 
And among these 49 patients, uh, 14 patients didn't achieve any ROSC, but 35 patients among these 49 patients achieved return of spontaneous circulation. And when you see all these 35 patients who has achieved ROSC uh, post intubation cardiac arrest, among these 35 patients, 22 patients died on day 28 mortality. So overall, day 28 mortality was around 73.5% among these 49 patients who have survived, who has sustained cardiac arrest during intubation. They have considered some patient factors <coughs> for the study. Uh, important patient factors was the age. So the median age for the patients who were uh, who had cardiac arrest during intubation was 67, and the median age for the patients who didn't have cardiac arrest during intubation was 62. Obviously, they also found that the patients who was more than 75 years old didn't do very well who had cardiac arrest. Other important characteristics was the high BMI in the study. So the patients who had high BMI didn't do well during the intubation or probably who had had cardiac arrest didn't survive after the cardiac arrest during intubation. They have also considered the reasons for intubation like the coma, shock, extubation failure, how much was the saturation before the intubation, uh, whether the patient was any vasopressors or any hemodynamic support. Other characteristics that they have considered uh, during the study was who was the intubator? Was it was it the anesthesiologist who was the intubator? What drugs that have they have used during the intubation? What muscle relaxant they have used? And the melampathy score for the assessment of the airway. They have also considered the situation whether there was there any real emergency of intubating the patient, which was defined as the intubation was required without any delay, or whether it was a relative emergency, which they have defined as the patient needed intubation within one hours, or deferred emergency, which they have defined whether the patient needed uh, intubation more than an hour. So regarding the outcome, <clears throat> we can see that there are several um, factors that they have uh, discussed whether it has implemented in the study. They have managed, they have said that there's five factors that mostly was included that can be <clears throat> there was mostly five factors in the outcome of the study uh, that contributed to the cardiac arrest of the patients after intubation, uh, severe hypoxia, severe collapse, cardiovascular collapse, uh, obesity, also, there was considered about the age more than 75 years old. So the intuition related cardiac arrest was recorded in 49 out of 1847 patients, which was around 2.7%. And to predict the intuition related cardiac arrest, five independent risk factors were identified, out of which three were potentially actionable high risk factors that may be that may respond to preventive approach, out of which was hypoxia prior to intubation. The odd, odds ratio was 3.99 for hypoxia. Hemodynamic failure prior to intubation. The odd ratio for hemodynamic failure is 3.40. Uh, absence of pre-oxygenation. Odd ratio for absence of pre-oxygenation was 3.5. And there was two other factors which was patient characteristics were also identified to be associated with cardiac arrest. One is obesity, um, BMI of more than 25. The odd ratio for that was two. And the other thing was the age more than 75 years. The odd ratio for that is also 2.25. Obviously, this was a multi uh, center study and one of the big study which was done for uh, cardiac arrest and mortality related to intubation. There are some limitations of the study. Um, 
The first limitation is the biasness, the possibility of reporting bias and inaccuracy that can also contribute to the study. Notable to eliminate the effort, effect of unmeasured confounders, whether the patient was on NIV before the intubation or the patient oh, intubation was delayed for trial of NIV. These confounders were was not considered in this study in terms of uh, seeing the cardiac arrest and mortality in intubation. Some data were missing in the oldest data sets and could not be found retrospectively. And finally, the databases were not designed to specifically assess the cardiac arrest outcomes and cannot give a reliable data for even chronology. These are the limitations of the study. And I think that's it. Any questions? Any questions? How's it going to your practice then, Sean? <laughs> Sean? Sorry, say that again. How's it going to change your practice? So as as they have mentioned, there's three factors that we can uh, address pre yeah. properly before the integration. Yeah. Um, yeah. Managing the hemodynamic compromise, so we have to optimize the blood pressure before intubating and prepare for uh, the inevitable if the blood pressure compromises. Mm -hmm. And uh, other thing was the hypoxia. We have to prevent hypoxia before intubating. Probably didn't hear that. Dr. Smith says he hopes that's not a change in your practice if you're on call, so that's stressful. <laughs> I think I think it's a reasonable. It, it's fairly predictable what that study found. I think, but it's the people that are really sick that we don't fix before we intubate them don't do very well. Mm. I guess. And yeah, we can try and optimize it there. There are situations where we can't we can't stop them being hypoxic because they won't stay still long enough or that's why they need intubating or we can't fix their blood pressure but i think it's definitely worth trying to trying to make it better if we can cool thanks for doing that thank you um is there anybody still there or has everybody buggered off and left you I'm just going to share, oh, or not. There you go. So you should be able to see the feedback link. Oh, damn it, I stopped sharing it. You both got it. <laughs> no, hang on, hang on. I stopped sharing it by accident. Press the right button. Yes. 21st. Don't fall over. There we go. I think I'm profoundly unconscious, so I'll have to do tomorrow's on call. <laughs> so, if people would like to fill in some feedback, you'll get a nice certificate for it. And Sean and Liv can get a certificate as well. I think the important thing is with those European studies, especially on survival intubation, is that they don't have to really be the spec forms. No, they don't seem to do that. And everyone is for intensive care and for tubing, and there's no discussion between the families or, or patients themselves to, you know, to express the wishes. So they're always skewed looking from the perspective of the person practicing in the UK. But I suspect for the other intensive cares, well, Europe wise and, they, and worldwide, the data is quite reliable. Cool. Um, <clears throat> next week, we're not actually having teaching. We're having a uh, joint surgical M&M &M over here, Slam. which I'm sure guys at Dunfield can join in if they want to. I'm not sure how interesting it will be, but 
I'm happy to share the link if you want. When I actually have it, because I don't have it yet. <clears throat> but thanks for doing that, Sean. Thank you. Matt, I hope you're having a good day. Living the dream. <laughs>